Welcome back to Meet Me in the Middle, part two of our founding story. Thank you so much for being here. I want to note that I'm releasing these parts following the timeline of when these key events unfolded in history. I've tried to summarize each founding story as being portrayed by each perspective while highlighting key events that impact each perspective to build these three parts as one common founding, which I will do at the very end of these three parts. These are in no way the complete founding story from each perspective. There are many important people, facts, dates, events that have happened in each one of these stories that may have not been highlighted here. I am not a teacher or a university educated individual on this subject. I am someone who read many books, watched many documentaries, cross-referenced all the information over many years. My rule being three respected sources need to claim these facts for me to share them here. I do encourage all of you to dig deeper, check the facts, understand these stories, as this is what's going to help us build our common founding story. This next part of our founding story will be told from the European immigrant perspective known as colonists in part one, and will be referred to as settlers in this part. This part will explore all the key events and players, as well as including who sent those settlers here. It's clear we all have been taught American history in different ways, as I spoke about in episode three, part one of this founding story. And to remind you all that there are 30 something textbooks telling this one story, which book is used in which state or district is dependent on the standards and curriculum that is set by the state governing bodies. What I was taught versus what my son has been taught is very different. Why? Educators as a whole continue to fight for accuracy and truth. However, the reality is the narrative is very important to educate and instill a set of core values driven by that perspective state. This can distort the view as a whole. These stories have been changed as well as new, um, due to new facts or debated facts becoming verified or ratified by top scholars. And the need to update facts is crucial to ensuring accuracy. It's important to note that most people do not revisit their history lessons after high school and some after college. So in general, the age of 18 or 26, the facts you know are the facts that you stand by throughout your life. So let's get started. The Americas as a continent were unknown to the early explorers who were sent on behalf of powerful monarchies in the interest of colonizing new lands to the benefit of those countries. America's early settlers were sent from the British, Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and French crowns. This will be this podcast will be focused, as was part one, on the territory we know today as the United States of America. 
This story starts not on the territory, the United States of America, however, is important to be highlighted. In 1492, Christopher Columbus landed in the Bahamas, sailing on the Pinta. Christopher Columbus did not land in the territory of the United States. This is the first misconception that I was told. And no other explorer was really mentioned. And Plymouth comes later in the story. However, Christopher Columbus's landing set off a spark across Europe in search of further undiscovered lands. None of these lands were undiscovered as they were inhabited. In 1507, Amerigo Vespucci, an Italian merchant on behalf of Spain, took part in the early voyages to the New World. It was a German cartographer who created the new map, naming the territory after Amerigo, hence the name America as a continent. However, this part will focus on the North American region, not including Canada, that was later split after the Treaty of Paris, which we will get into later. It is important to note that there were many explorers who came and set up colonies and tried to establish colonies. However, all settlements would eventually come under either British rule or become part of the United States through the expansion of the country. There are three distinct colony groups that we will go into. New England, the Middle Colonies, and the Southern Colonies. It's important to note that in 1585, the Roanoke Colony was established and failed and was known as the Lost Colony of North Carolina. In 1607, there was another colony founded off the coast of Maine and was abandoned. Also in 1607, the Jamestown colony was established by the London Company. This was the first colony to stick and starts our story. This colony was later named the Virginia Colony. Jamestown settlers were led by Captain John Smith and introduced to the Powhatan tribe whose chief, Wahansneka, later referred to as Chief Powhatan. There were many tensions, and John Smith was captured and later returned to Jamestown. They brokered the first peace deal with the natives, who helped them over the years survive as a colony, as it was almost abandoned due to starvation. In 1614, Pocahontas, whose real name was Mato Aku, the daughter of Chief Powhatan, was taken by the settlers and was used to broker peace by marrying John Rolfe, a tobacco farmer from Jamestown. This did bring peace and it was said that they found love over years. Many accounts of the Powhatan tri- natives giving food to the settlers and enacting trade helped the colony survive. Between 1609 and 1610, this was known by the Jamestown settlers as the starving time. Only 60 settlers survived out of the original 500. The pilgrims on the Mayflower started their journey much earlier in 1605 when they split from the Church of England to form a separatist congregation carrying the brownest beliefs. It was illegal to not attend Sunday service at a Church of England, and the crime was by way of a fine of one shilling for every Sunday missed. Under the Act of Uniformity Eufor- that passed in 15. 15- 59 and the Seditious Secretaries Act of 1593 
in England with the emphasis aimed at outlawing, outlawing the brownest beliefs from being practiced. The brownest were fined and imprisoned with some of the leaders being executed in 1593. The London separatists fled England and immigrated to Amsterdam, Holland. That is when they really started to be known as the Puritans. When King's, King James I came into power, he was petitioned by the Puritans for their independence. This was denied. But what was set in motion is the fact that he instructed many scholars to complete a new translation of the Bible, now known as the King James Bible. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Tobias Matthews, set off a campaign to purge the archdiocese of nonconformity influences. This included the separatist Puritans. The Puritans in Holland gathered their resources and procured a ship to the New World. The ship's name was called the Speedwell. The Speedwell headed to Southampton to meet up with the Mayflower to sail the Atlantic together. Not even off the English coast, the Speedwell took on water and was forced to dock in Plymouth in Devon, England. The Speedwell was deemed not worthy. They sold the ship and 102 passengers were chosen amongst those two passenger groups to board the Mayflower heading for Virginia. The Pilgrims had applied for a patent to set up a colony in Plymouth. Only 28 of the original Puritans made up the 102 passengers. On the journey, one crew member and one passenger died. However, there was also a berth on board, leaving the number of settlers to be 102. They landed in Province Harbor, where a few settlers used a small boat to head to Plymouth to prepare the way, but were unable to get there due to weather. So they headed on the Mayflower after two weeks in port to Plymouth. Since no patent was obtained to form a colony, the settlers decided to organize a civil body that would allow the settlers to vote on issues important to the colony. This was the first sign of American democracy on the Mayflower. This was ratified by the majority rule, 41 settlers. There were 74 males and 28 females on board. Only the med could vote and sign, so 41 men decided on behalf of the 102 settlers. This is sometimes referred to as the first constitution. They all agreed to keep to a just and equal set of laws. The pilgrims finally arrive at Plymouth Harbor. The new Plymouth colony was formed in 1620. They kept the name Plymouth in honor of the port that they took off from in England. There were 20 men that went ashore to place cannons on the hill and build the first houses. The majority of settlers stayed on board for approximately six months. 45 of the 102 pilgrims died of diseases such as scurvy. They were buried on Coles Hill. Seven houses and four common houses were erected and the pilgrims settled into their new home. John Carver was named the first governor. In 1621, a formal treaty was drafted with the Wapanog tribe. Their chief, Massasoit, became good friends with the settlers and advocated trade with them. They agreed to come to each other's aid in time of war. Also in 1621, 53 surviving settlers of the Plymouth colony and 90 of Chief Massasoit's men celebrated a harvest known as the First Thanksgiving. This celebration lasted three days. The settlers brought water fowl, wild turkey, and fish, while the natives brought five deer. Squanto, who came with Chief Massasoit, previously captured and trafficked traffic to Spain from the Cape Cod Bay. 
and sold. And, and he ended up in England, where he was released back to his land. When he arrived, he discovered his entire tribe had been wiped out. And so he went to join the Wapanog. Squanto remained with the pilgrims and taught them how to survive on these new lands and spread the word amongst the tribes to enact trade with the settlers. This trade mainly consisted of furs and was very lucrative. It's important to note the Dutch, the French, the Spanish, the Swedish, all tried and, and some successfully established colonies across the lands as well but would all come under the British crown or uh, into the United States as expansion continued. Many battles ensued and many stories of strife for the settlers and the natives alike. In 1709, the first slave market was erected in New York and sold native and African slaves to the new colonies. This spread throughout the lands and really grew heavy in the southern colonies. There were three distinct groups, as I spoke about earlier, of colonies that were formed to complete the 13 original colonies that formed the Union. The New England colonies. In 1620, the Plymouth colony was established. In 1622, the Maine colony the main province, sorry, was established. And in 1628, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was established. The Plymouth Colony was absorbed into the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1691. The main province was absorbed into the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1658. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was then given the Royal Colony status in 1691. New Hampshire Province was established in 1629. It was absorbed into the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1647 and then reestablished as its own Royal Colony in 1679. The Connecticut Colony consisted of Saybrook Colony, which was established in 1635, the Connecticut Colony, established in 1636, and the New Haven Colony in 1638. Saybrook Colony was absorbed into the Connecticut Colony in 1644. The New Haven Colony was absorbed into the Connecticut Colony in 1662. The Connecticut colony received its royal colony status in 1662. The Rhode Island colony. In 1638, the province of Plantations was established. In 1639, the Portsmouth colony was established. In 1639, the Newport province was established. In 1642, the Warwick province was established. In 1663, the Rhode Island colony was established. The province of Plantations was absorbed by the Rhode Island colony in 1663, along with the Portsmouth colony, Newport province, Warwick province, all absorbed in 1663, and the Rhode Island colony was given its royal colony status in 1663. The New England Federation consisted of these four royal colonies and were included in the domain of New England. The Massachusetts Bay Colony, the New Hampshire Province Colony, Connecticut Colony, and the Rhode Island Colony. The Middle Colonies were started in 1664 when the province of New York colony was established. Also in 1664 were the Delaware colony, the province of New Jersey colony, which was later split in 1674 into East and West colonies. The province of Pennsylvania was established in 1681. New York was 
established as a royal colony in 1686, the Delaware and the Pennsylvania pro, uh, colonies uh, remained independent proprietary colonies. In 1702, the East and West Colony of New Jersey was then absorbed into one colony, calling it New Jersey. The Southern Colonies. In 1607, the Virginia Colony was established. In 1632, Maryland Province was established. In 1670, North Carolina Province was established. In 1670, also, the South Carolina province was established. However, in 1712, the Carolina colony absorbed the North and South colonies of North Carolina. However, they received their independent status as separate colonies in 1729 under royal colony status. Maryland remained a proprietary colony and Virginia was established as a royal colony in 1624. These times were hard on the settlements as they became colonies and many battles with natives ensued, as you learned in part one of our founding story. The overreaching issue of starvation were eased through treaties and growth of the settlements and new settlers coming from Europe. In 1685, King James II of England consolidated the New England colonies and grouped New York, East and West New Jersey, and added to the New England domain. He appointed a governor, Edmund Andros, who was overthrown in 1689, and the Dominion failed. And the colonies, the 13 colonies, went back to their royal colony charters. Thirteen colonies stood as British North America and were restricted to trade with other European nations. The improved economic conditions and the relaxing of religious persecutions in Europe made it hard to attract settlers and labor to the colonies, which increased the need for slave labor, native and African. England had been selling the debts of those imprisoned and sold into labor to work off their debts to the colonists. So at the time, they were sending their prisoners to work off their debts who could eventually work off their debt and become free. The slave trade was far larger in the southern colonies as the agricultural plantations of cotton and tobacco grew. The other European immigrants started to come to the New World and mostly migrated to the central colonies, which grew in diversity of ethnicity and religion. Those were the province of New York, Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. In 1740, the first Great Awakening in England, also known as the Evangelical Revival, spread to the colonies. The 13 colonies were already religiously diverse. The New England colonies held on to a more congr congressional church practice and was a, the established religion. The middle colonies had the Quakers, the Dutch Reformed, Anglican, uh, Pre Presbyterian, Lutheran, Baptist, and congressional churches, and they were all treated in equal terms. The southern colonies adopted the Anglican uh, as their religion, even though they did have a large population of Quakers, Baptist, and Presbyterian. Some of the colonies, such as those in Plymouth Colony, took a strong stance on what was of God and what was not during the hysteria of the Salem witch trials which could have a podcast of its own. So we will kind of leave it there. However, it's important to note that the witch trials were also driven and sought out by using the published works of demonology also put out by King, King James. And I think that's important to highlight. This is really only to highlight how some of the colonies were strict in their beliefs and wanted their beliefs filtered into their governance. 
Low church attendance and the rise of the Enlightenment rationalism, which began with the principles of liberty and religious tolerance, filtered to the colonies as well. This was in direct opposition to the monarchical, monarchical congregational church values and dogma of the church that led many converting to atheism, Unitarianism, and Universalism. The history of religion in the early days of the colonies proved to be problematic for some and free for others. This was for sure a driving factor in the founders' decisions of separating church and state. In 1675 to 1678, King Philip's war that included a thousand men from the colonies and 150 natives fighting as a group set the stage for the realization that colonies are setting their own identity separate from Great Britain many years before the American Revolution. In 1774, uh, the British Parliament passed a series of laws collectively known as the Intolerable Acts with the intent to suppress unrest in colonial Boston by closing the port and placing it under martial law. In response, colonial protesters led by a group called the Sons of Liberty issued a call for a boycott. Merchant communities were reluctant to participate in such a boycott unless there was mutually agreed unless there were mutually agreed upon terms and a means to enforce the boycott's provisions. Spurred by local pr- pressure groups, the colonial legislators empowered delegates to attend a Continental Congress, which would set the terms for a boycott. The Continental Congress was the governing body by which the American colonial governments coordinated their resistance to British rule. The Congressional, the Congress balanced the interests of the different colonies and also established itself as the official colonial liaison to Great Britain. The Congress became the effective national government of the country and as such conducted diplomacy on behalf of the United States. The Second Congress uh, in 1775, it was a meeting of the delegates from the 13 colonies that united in support of the American Revolutionary War. The Congress created a new country that it had first named the United Colonies and in 1776 renamed it to the United States of America. Then the federal capital, which representatives from 12 to 13 colonies, this came shortly after the battles of Lexington and Concord and was in succession to the first Continental Congress, which met in in 1774. The second Congress functioned as a de facto national government at the outset of the Revolutionary War by raising armies, directing strategy, appointing diplomats, and writing petitions, such as the declaration of the causes and necessity of taking up arms and the Olive Branch Petition. All 13 colonies were represented by the, by the time the Congress adopted the Lee Resolution, which declared independence from Britain in July 2nd, 1776. The Congress then agreed to the Declaration of Independence two days later. In 1775, directly after the Second Congress, the American Revolution began. All colonies, natives, and slaves fought together on the same side and opposing sides. This was the fight for independence and continued until declared independent. The Declaration of Independence. By issuing the Declaration of Independence adopted by the Continental Congress, 
On July 4, 1776, 13 American colonies served their political con- uh, severed, sorry, their co- political connections to Great Britain. The declaration summarized the colonists' motivations for seeking independence by declaring themselves as an independent nation. The American colonists were able to confirm an official alliance with the government of France and obtain French assistance to the war against Great Britain. Also in 1776, the Model Treaty, it was a template for commercial treaties that the United States Continental Congress sought to make with France and Spain in order to secure assistance in the struggle against Britain in the American Revolution. Congress approved the treaty on September 1776. The model treaty did not contain provisions for direct military support, but rather for the supply of weapons and other indirect assistance, in addition to favorable commercial terms. The Treaty of Amity and and Commerce that the United States and France concluded in 1778 was based on this treaty and was signed concurrently with the Treaty of Alliance that included provisions of military nature. The model treaty also served as a template for further commercial treaties the United States would make in the coming years. In 1777, the Articles of Confederation served as the written document that established the functions of the national government of the United States after it declared independence from Great Britain. It established a weak central government that mostly but not entirely prevented the individual states from conducting their own foreign diplomacy. In 1783, The Treaty of Paris, signed in Paris by representatives of King George III of Great Britain and representatives of the United States on September 3, 1783. This officially ended the American Revolutionary War, an overall state of conflict between the two countries. The treaty set the boundaries between British North America, later called Canada, and the United States on lines that British labeled as exceedingly generous. Details included fishing rights and restoration of property and prisoners of war. This treaty and the separate peace treaties between Great Britain and the nations that supported the American cause, including French, uh, France, Spain, and the Dutch Republic, are known collectively as the Peace of, of Paris. Only Article I of the treaty, which acknowledges the United States' existence as free, sovereign, and independent states, remains in force. In 1787, the Constitutional Convention to draft the Constitution began. In 1787, the Federalist Papers were also written to help justify the ratification of the Constitution. In 1787, the Bill of Rights were drafted as part of the ratification of the Constitution to satisfy the objections to the Constitution by the Anti-Federalists. In 1788, the Constitution was ratified. On March 4, 1789, the Constitution became effective and has remained to this day as a document that all laws of this land were meant to adhere to the founding principles of the Constitution. All of these founding documents will be discussed in great detail in our Founding Documents podcast, which will be in the future. This will include the treaties with the Native tribes as well. The expansion west and the adding of states to the Union brought over 90 wars in the United States that they fought with foreign settlers and native tribes with fierce brutality, which was discussed in part one. The states became part of the Union one by one, and the states, the first state being Delaware, becoming a state in 1787 with the last state becoming a state 
1959, which was Hawaii. When building this story, it was important to link the key events with the other two perspectives to build our common story. The realities of each perspective cannot be accurately told for anyone other, from other, anyone other than those who hold the trauma, as that is partly why we are here today. This is the only way that people can identify and feel included in a one founding story. This has not been fully realized and has been the a very big part of misunderstanding, misrepresentation, anger, and much debate that still exists today about what our founding story should include. The next and final part of our founding story will be told from the perspective of the African slaves brought here by the settlers or colonists or European immigrants. One final part that should be spoken about is after the states and the constitution was adopted, it's important to highlight that in 1860, 11 states threatened to secede from the Union if Abraham Lincoln was elected president. In 1861, the Confederate states were created and a battle ensued called the American Civil War. The 11 states are as follows. Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas, Arizona, and New Mexico started out as Confederate states as they didn't receive their statehood until 1912. The Civil War started April 12, 1861 and ended May 26, 1865. The central cause of the war was the dispute over whether slavery would be permitted to expand into the Western territories, leading to more slave states, or be prevented from doing so, which was widely believed that this would end slavery, which the Southern states were heavily dependent on in their agricultural endeavors of tobacco and cotton. The next and final part of our founding story will be told from the perspective of the African slaves brought here by the settlers, colonists, or European immigrants, and the American Civil War will be discussed in more great detail in that section. Meet Me in the Middle is all about understanding the truth and accepting these perspectives as facts, and it is as its key to building a common story. Being heard and validated lends to talking about the hard issues that will allow us to make change together by starting from one place, the middle ground. Thank you so much for listening, and please don't forget to share, like, and rate to grow our audience to attract key uh, guests in the future to debate and discuss the hard issues that we will get to ahead after laying these foundations. Thank you so much and see you on the next episode.